and we are live so as always to support this program you can join the channel directly at just one dollar a month you can also subscribe to oxum.substack.com free and paid subscriptions or head over to patreon.com slash oxum many ways to give many ways to show your appreciation there is there are of course also super chats and super stickers depending on how many people enter so a lot of things have been happening in the news that remind me of the idea of the Austrian economist Joseph Schumpeter, which is summated in the great compound word that sounds oxymoronic, creative destruction. Creative destruction is the idea that when you are in a market economy, or you know, people could argue about how interventionist it, it is, so you can call it a mixed economy if you'd like, but for the most part, a market economy in somewhere like the United States, you have the old blockbuster, the old borders, the old Toys R Us going away, and you have the new coming in, the Netflix, the Amazon, things like that. In the media space, we've seen BuzzFeed fail this week, and they've been bleeding for a while. I would argue ever since, and I wouldn't be the only one in the chattering class to say so, ever since their main enemy, which was uh, became their chasson de atra, uh, Donald J. Trump left office. So I wanted to use a BuzzFeed-like title. Are Ethiopians black? Let's have fun with this clickbait. But also let's get serious into the literature. And I would say a major issue I have with BuzzFeed and BuzzFeed-like media organizations and their sister accomplices in academe is that there are a lot of these word cell, overly intellectualized, philosophized, humanities only think pieces that have a total disregard for the science, capital S, science. And so when you look at fields of medicine and when you look at fields of biology, specifically we'll look at population genetics today, uh, as well as culture, I think it would be foolhardy to go all STEM and only talk about pop gen or population genetics. It's also foolhardy to just talk about culture. And the ultimate answer to the question of are Ethiopians black or any such question is going to have to be some balance of the humanities and STEM. It's going to be a balance and hence the name of the show the philosophy of art and science, right? That's the name of the podcast, the philosophy of art and science. Shout out to Dr. Peter Tia's book. I'll have to review it when I'm done. I'm listening to the audio book. I'm like 33% of the way done. He wrote his new book on longevity, which he called the science and art. He put the science first because that's where he thought the importance is, but he did not neglect the art because there is an aesthetic part of how you want to do what you do. The science is probably in living long and the art is in living well. I think, uh, I don't know if there's any category of knowledge in which you don't want to apply both STEM and humanities, both science and art. And for me, the smartest people, let me rephrase it. The people who I have considered the smartest are generalists in that sense. I, I always respect a good shokunin, a great craftsman, a great specialist, but the the most intelligent people, in my opinion, are those who excel greatly at the humanities and greatly at STEM. Usually they begin at STEM and then branch out to the humanities. If you can provide me counter examples of people who start in humanities and go to STEM, I, I would love to hear it. Curtis Yarvin, Nassim Taleb, Stephen Wolfram. These are really great examples of people who started in STEM and branched out to humanities and were pinnacles in their field. My Hebrew teacher, Father Paul Nadim Tarazi, he got his first degree as an MD, as a medical doctor. And then he went and got uh, his PhD in, I forget what exactly it was, but probably Near Eastern Studies or something like that. But he speaks Romanian, Biblical Hebrew, Biblical Greek. 
Arabic, uh, both uh, Palestinian dialect as well as probably Egyptian dialect, Lebanese dialect, and the modern standard Arabic or the Fusha English, which has been his teaching language for over 40 years. So these people are impressive because of the breadth of their, the breadth and the depth and the width and the length and the height of their knowledge in both STEM and in humanities. And so I'm going to approach the question of are Ethiopians black from population genetics and from culture. Dave, the Bali kid, shout out to you, Dave. Uh, Bali, Ethiopia, or is that short for something uh, somewhere else? Anyway, um, there are a lo lot of other kind of political things too. It wasn't just BuzzFeed that died this week, right? Today, you had Tucker leaving Fox or getting kicked out, you know, let the let the future tell us what the answer is to that. CNN, Don, uh, Don Lemon, departure. Susan Rice departs from the Biden regime. Uh, you know, she's the mistress of TPLF. So a lot of kind of media and politics departures today and this week. But I give you the BuzzFeed like clickbait article in homage to the creative destruction that took place with them and that creative destruction that is continuing to play place at CNN, at Fox News, and the Biden regime. The future is bright, and let's get to our, our main question. So that I don't use Wikipedia, let's use the CIA. I don't know if they're more trustworthy. Um, but they have listed as the ethnic groups of Ethiopia, and I'll, I'll argue and, and put my own spices on it, but let's start off with them. From their 2022 estimate from CIA.gov, they have the Oromo at 35.8%, the Amhara at 24.1%, the Somali at 7.2%. A little parenthesis I'm going to put in there for the audience that doesn't know. I read today from somewhere else that there are more Somali ethnic Somalis in Ethiopia than in any of the other Somalias. Somalia is a very complicated country. You look at it on a map, it looks like it's one country. That country is split into three different areas. It's southern, easternmost area around the capital of Mogadishu is basically a puppet state of the United States military, equivalent to Afghanistan before the U.S. military pulled out of it. Then you have the Puntland and the Somaliland in the corner uh, of, of that country and then on its uh, northwestern side. Then you have Djibouti, which is half Somali. And then you have the Somali region of Ethiopia, which contains all these Somalis. So the Somalians or the ethnic Somali are pretty much scattered across five major different nation states, three different Somalias, Djibouti, and Ethiopia. And it seems that if not the biggest number, at least a significant number, and a friend of mine, shout out to him, uh, questioned the the value of the statistics in the Horn of Africa, which I question as well, but you, you got to go based off of uh, something. Gabe, why is this a question? Uh, well, stay tuned and you'll figure it out. Don't stay tuned and you won't figure it out. Um, because what does it mean to be black? That's, that's why. Is it biological or is it cultural? That's a question that we're going to be addressing. I would argue that it's some combination of the two. So uh, again, we have the Oromo at 35.8%, the Amhara at 24.1%, the Somali at 7.2%, the Tigray at 5.7%, Sidama at 4.1%, Gurage at 2.6%, Wolaita at 2.3%, Afar 2.2%, Silte 1.3%, Kaficho 1.2%, and Other at 13.5%, again from CIA.gov. So... I would argue that it's difficult to ascertain the genuine ethnic groups of Ethiopia, um, and but it's not impossible. And the way the CIA and the TPLF, which are friends, kind of try to do it is based off of linguistics and language. And over the past 30 or so years, they've kind of changed the speaking capacity and abilities of the country almost in an incontrovertible way uh, to make it so it's like almost a self-fulfilling prophecy of what their end goal is. So 
the larger language families. I mean, Afro-Asiatic covers most, mostly everything, okay? But the subfamily underneath, the subfamilies underneath Afro-Asiatic, which is why I always use the word Afro-Asiatic because it, it's very explanatory. It's very powerful. And it lets you know everything is African and Asian. And that's what we are. We're East African and we're West Asian. And I'm, I'm going to get into that. Uh, especially because... As a kid, I was a big fan of another type of Afro-Asiatic, which is West African and East Asian, it's kind of the reverse on both of those. We're East African and West Asian, but growing up, the Wu-Tang Clan represented music influenced by East Asia and West Africa within the United States. So it's something to think about, and we'll address that again. But for me, the ethnic groups are the subcategories of Afro-Asiatic, and they're not perfect because one... There are a lot of guddifatja, which is an Oromo word used in Amharic, or adoption, adopted people, adopted tribes. There's a lot of intermarriage in the major cities. Um, but these groups, these population groups being difficult to categorize does not mean they don't exist. They do exist. And we have to contend with that. And we have to contend with the history of that. So the subcategories under Afro-Asiatic that are most useful are Cushitic and Semitic. Omotic is kind of an interesting beast in it itself, but it describes a very tiny minority, less than 1% as far as I know. Nilotic is outside of Afro-Asiatic and is also important, but it is a group that, and we'll come back to it, is out, outside of the Afro-Asiatic language family. So it's not a subcategory. And again, it's like 1% or less. But again, we'll, we'll come back to that genetically. Um, so I first did 23andMe in 2016 because there were all of these conversations that I would get with Ethiopians from Ethiopia, Ethiopians from America, Black Americans from America, uh, Africans from Africa, Black people of the Caribbean, uh, WASP, uh, white American Anglo-Saxon Protestants, um, my Jewish friends as well. And I would, I would get all of these questions and debates about the Blackness of Ethiopians. And then the blackness of Ethiopian Americans versus the blackness of Ethiopian Ethiopians. So again, we, we have to define what these words mean and get to it. I see uh, Gabe uh, getting agitated there in the comments. Listen, you haven't even heard what I said, so you don't know what I'm going to say, yet you already find things strange. I find it strange to question Ethiopia's quality of being black with languages since other nations like Nigeria have a vast amount of languages. Yeah, you haven't heard the argument. It's not about languages, it's about genetics. And there's a great correlation and Venn diagram between the language and the genetics. But I'm telling you, they're not perfect stand-ins. There's a lot of difficulty in ascertaining the differences between these groups, but it doesn't mean that they don't exist. The more important thing here is the genetics more than the language. It's the CIA and the TPLF that focus on the languages exclusively. I'm focusing on the genetics, which is the science, and then the art, which is the culture, which will include the languages, but also how you self-identify and so many other things, which are, which are important. But again, they're not the sole matters of importance. So anyway, I, I had many statements said to me. I had just as one example, a naive thought from the time I was a kid till I was in college that I know where my parents are from. I know where my grandparents are from. I know where my great grandparents are from. I know where my great great grandparents are from. They're all from Africa. Go two, four, eight, sixteen. Go to all my uh, ancestors within recent memory, even up to seven generations and beyond. They're all in Africa. So my naive thought is I'm 100% Africa. And then there's this statement you hear that you take out of context from population genetics or geneticists 
you hear there's more diversity in Africa than anywhere else. That's true. But you have to flesh out what that means. And I would hear that and just think the reason I look a little different than, let's say, someone from the Gambela region of Ethiopia, we're both 100% African. It's just the, the natural diversity of Africa that makes me look different. That's not really the case. The natural diversity of Africa explains the difference between a Bantu West African and a Nilotic East African. That, that is explained by the diversity of Africa, as well as that all Europeans and Asians, meaning West Eurasians and East Eurasians, they all came from Africa, right? Now, the ones in Europe mixed with some Neanderthals and the ones in uh, East Asia mixed with some Denisovans. So there's a little bit of difference of that. And the ones in uh, Oceania are up to 5% Denisovan. So there are differences, right? But yeah, in one sense, the we're all Africans thing is true, uh, at least to an extent, right? You know, at, 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 like at minimum up to like 95%, right? So it's, it's overwhelmingly true. It's just about how many, how many hundreds, for me, it's like 50 years. My family's been in the US and left Africa. But before that, asking other people, it's like, how many decades, how many hundreds of years, how many centuries, right? How many millennia, how many tens of millennia has it been since you were in Africa or since your family was in Africa? And so anyway, overwhelmingly, the ethnicities of Ethiopia are Cushitic and Semitic. It's not that the languages, but the, the DNA matches that very greatly. We'll come back to it. So I thought of myself as naively 100% African until college. And then in college, I kept getting it more and more. Some people asked if I was half white, half black. Some people asked if I was um, half Middle Eastern, half black. Some people asked if I was Indian. Some people asked if I was Filipino. Some people asked if I was Dominican or Cuban or Puerto Rican. Um, I would always get these questions. One day, three of my black friends, black women, sat me down and they said, you know, I've met red bones. I've met yellow bones. I've met people who have a red undertone. But you're the first person in my life that I met who has red overtones. And at the time, I didn't really know how to take or receive that. I thought it was funny. And I just kind of explained to them that all my ancestry, as far as I know, is 100% African. And so that they're seeing things. And so, you know, they were physiognomy checking me. And I was denying them to their face what they kind of implicitly, if not explicitly, recognized. So what they implicitly recognized that I didn't explicitly recognize until years later is that the average African-American in the United States is 80% black, if we mean black only in a genetic way, which means the African ancestry component, component that is not Eurasian at all. Here's the difference. My black women friends that were interrogating me, their African side is different than my African side. And their Eurasian side, which is on average 20%, is different than my Eurasian side. So the Kushites in general, again, not just a language, but the Kushites of Ethiopia, the Afar, although the Afar are slightly more mixed with the Semitic from the data that I have seen, and I'll present the data to you. Um, but generally speaking, like the Somali, the Oromo, the Afar, and what the Ago were before the second admixture event are usually 60% Black, meaning unadulterated African, and 40% prehistoric or Mesolithic, Middle Stone Age, um, West Eurasian. Now, it's so deep into prehistory, you don't really know what these people look like, but they look something like a South Indian. They're not from South India, but they look something like that, which is why some people think we look that way. They look like the Cheddar Man of England. If you know the Cheddar Man of England, the original inhabitants of the UK were these white people who were dark skinned. So they had the facial features of the current Brits, but they were darker skinned. 
and uh, the Anglo-Saxons when they came and uh, mixed with them, dominated that society. And I think something like 90% of them went away and, and they didn't totally like disappear. Obviously they mixed with the people. Um, so there's like some, at least one British guy who's a descendant of the cheddar man. And you could, you can Google cheddar man and find him out in the UK, see what he looks like. He has like the straight hair and the facial features of what someone you recognize as a UK person today, but his skin is very dark. Even his eyes are the same sort of bluish or, or greenish color. So some type of person like that, which some people in the literature and online identify as Natufian like, not Natufian, but Natufian like. So they could have been in North Africa at the time. They could have been in the Sinai Peninsula. Who knows exactly where they were, but they were some type of people who had left Africa along with all Europeans and Asians 60,000 years ago. And they made their way back to the Horn of Africa and mixed with some people that were either Nilotic or Elmotic, the original East Africans. And so all the Kushites, the Afar, the Somali, the Oromo are roughly, and, and like I said, the Afar are a little bit more Eurasian than the others, but especially the Somali and the Oromo and what the Ago were before the second admixture are 60% East African and 40% prehistoric, Mesolithic, Middle Stone Age, West Eurasian. That's a mouthful, but say it's 60% black and then 40% Eurasian. And the thing about that Eurasian and the reason why the Kushites are still dark skinned is because they were dark skinned white people, if that makes sense, if, if, to use very imprecise, not good language. Then you have the Semites who are not pure Semites. If they were pure Semites, they would look like the pure Semites. And, and who knows, you know, like how many of those are even left. But the closest thing that we have in the literature to like what the original pure Semite group would look like, look at the Assyrians. Interestingly enough, look at the people from the ancient people from the island of Crete, the Minoans and the Tunisians. Now, after the Minoan civilization falls and you have the Mycenaean civilization, you have a lot of uh, mixing now with some Indo-Europeanized or steppe ancestry of something like between five and 15%. Um, and what we come to know as the Greek culture. So that, that culture comes to do dominate the island of Crete. But that original Bronze Age Anatolian DNA, um, there's an interesting continuum. And it's funny that uh, there's a famous line spread uh, by Yarvin about what Orwell said about Greeks, Jews, and Armenians. But on the ethnic continuum, one of the things that surprised me is that there is this connection between Greeks, Jews, and Armenians, and particularly Greeks of the island of Crete, especially the ancient Greeks, I, I wouldn't even call them that, Minoans, and Tunisian Jews. And so something like Tunisian Jews, something like ancient Minoans, then comes and forms the 10% of the DNA of the Amhara, the Tigray, the Gurage, uh, Silte, Arboba, other, other Semitic groups of Ethiopia. So the Semite is, again, not a pure Semite, but is something like, let's say, 50% Black, if we're speaking only genetically, or 50% original East African, something like a Nilote, neither Nilotic or Omotic, that then mixes with something like a Natufian, which is like a Cheddar Man or a, or a South Indian, kind of dark-skinned Eurasian. And then they mix again, the second admixture. And this second mix is with a Semite, is with something like a Tunisian Jew or something like a Minoan. So the Amhara, Tigray, Gurage are a mixture of three main things. The Afar, Somali, and Oromo, and like I said, it's, it's a little complicated, are a mixture of like two things. And this is our identity um, 
Oh, Dave, the Bali kid. Bali as in Bali song, butterfly knife. I'm just a white boy who found you through mold bug and found your insights into Ethiopian history and culture. Fascinating. Dope. I'm trying to get him on again for round three. Good things come in uh, threes. It's a little dark, so I'm, I'm actually going to run. Excuse me for 10 seconds. I'm going to run and put some lights on. All right, we should have a little bit more light there. Thank you for staying with me, those of you who are still here in the live stream. So are Ethiopians black? If we're talking about genetics, and if genetics is the matter, and it's the only matter, I'll say, yes, Ethiopians are black. The only caveat I'll give is that you have to have a philosophical discussion. In America, there was this horrible one-drop rule because of how wretched they thought black blood was and how they wanted to measure that against all other things. And they said, um, well, it depends on the percentage, but you have to think, okay, if you're half black, are you still black? I would say, if you want to be, yeah. What about if you're a quarter? Well, what if you're 12.5%? Well, what if you're 6%? What if you're 3%? There has to be a fine line somewhere I don't know where it is, and I don't want to drop it. 50% seems reasonable. 25% gets questionable. And so people have to figure that out for themselves. But I would say Ethiopia is split almost 50-50 between people who are 60% Black and 50% Black. And that makes up over 90% of the populace. So at a minimum, over 90% of the populace is 90, uh, excuse me, is 50 to 60% black. If we just by black mean only an African component. And that's legit. And then those people who are 40% non-African, right? Again, these, these labels all take philosophizing. You can critically think and question all these labels, but the kind of 40% non-African has been in Africa for a minimum of 23,000 years after having left Africa 60,000 years ago. That remaining 10% after having left Africa 60,000 years ago has been in Africa for 3,000 years. If Elon Musk's family, the Afrikaners, were instead of being, you know, pure North European, all mixed with all the local Africans that were Black Africans, and then their mixed children had been in South Africa for 3,000 years instead of 300 years, you know, at what point do you not just say they're fully African if they want to be? This is where the art comes in. This is where the culture comes in. This is where the philosophy and the critical thinking and the self-determination on a group level as a group identity and then as an individual identity. You know, my mom is extremely light-skinned and probably higher in the Eurasian component than the average Ethiopian. She's been mistaken by Chinese, by Chinese people, which I found really funny. Uh, very often, that was rare very often mistaken by uh, uh, Hispanics as Hispanic. Literally like spoken to in these languages, in Chinese and Spanish, as if she's trying to pose as if she's not. Now, to be fair, we were in the lot of a 99 ranch market, an Asian market when the Asian person approached her. Um, and hey, we are West Asian. But she's always been firmly pushing the narrative since I was a child that she's 100% African and nobody could take that away from her. Well, at the same time, on a deep down level and in personal conversations, she knows there are some admixtures. She knows it. And um, recent DNA and genetics have confirmed to this stuff. So that, that's something you have to think about. I'm going to throw another uh, monkey wrench into the situation. Here's something tricky I just learned in the past two years. Again, I, I did my first 23 and Me in 2016, and the data has been updating ever since. It kind of at first said I was 66% Sub-Saharan African 
and 33% North African. So I took that as kind of the end all be all, but it took it to be updating. Like now it just says I'm 99.9 .9 repeating Ethiopian and not Eritrean, like specifically Ethiopian. And it puts me in, in the central and Northern highlands, which is uh, Amhara Oromo, which is, is what I know. I have a seventh ancestor who is uh, Tigrayan and thus him onwards, something like 3% Tigrayan, but I guess it doesn't show up or it's within the margin of error. Um, patrilineally, uh, beginning with my great grandfather, Oromo. So I have the, I forget the name of it. It's like E1 V32. I think that's it. But I have the, the Cushitic line on my patrilineal line, my father's father's father's. On my mother's line, I, I have someone that is located somewhere 10,000 years ago in the Caucasus uh, Mountains, just south of the Caucasus Mountains. And so that's from all my mother's mother's mother's. So my son will not get that. It'll be cut off with me because that's transferred just to the women. But it, it's interesting. And I, I had seen those things for years, but it wasn't until speaking to uh, the geneticist Razib Khan, whose substack I recommend, Razib Khan's Unsupervised Learning. He's a Bangladeshi man, but interested in South Asia in general or the Indian subcontinent. And he writes a lot of great things about genetics. I've been reading his blog for a couple of years on substack, as well as uh, corresponding with him in um, Clubhouse, the audio social media, as well as Twitter, as well as through email. And so through reading uh, papers, which I'll share, there's one by Robert, uh, excuse me, not Robert, David Reich, uh, Bridget Packendorf, Joseph Pickrell, called Ancient West Eurasian Ancestry in Southern and Eastern Africa, Ancient West Eurasian Ancestry in Southern and East Africa. I'll try to share with you. It's a 69 page PDF, but you could find summaries of it online as well. There's another one by some Italians, Ludovica Molinaro, Luca Pagani, Francesco Motinaro, uh, and, and so on and so forth. West Asian sources of the Eurasian component in Ethiopians, a reassessment. So this was a reassessment of former DNA and data that they had. The Reich one is from 2014. The Italian one is from 2019. So we have West Asian sources of the Eurasian component in Ethiopians, a reassessment as well as ancient West Eurasian ancestry in Southern and Eastern Africa. So this, that, that Reich paper is interesting because it compares the Khoisan and other people in South Africa as well. Maybe that's why the Musk and the Afrikaners were on my mind. But here's something I learned from all of this kind of personal study of biology, of uh, evolution, of population genetics over the past few years. and. This is something you got to grapple with because of the out of Africa theory, which again has been re-advised because of the Neanderthals and Denisovans, all Europeans and Asians. So all West Eurasians and East Eurasians, including the ones in like Papua New Guinea and the Nat Native Americans or American Indians, all of them left Africa 60,000 years ago because of where Ethiopia is situated in East Africa and the Horn of Africa. The genetic diversity that existed in Africa, where 60,000 years ago, there were like 100,000 people spread all over Africa. But in East Africa, there were not 100,000 people. There were thousands of people. All Eurasians come from about 1,000 to 10,000 people 60,000 years ago that were in East Africa. And they're separate from the Black side or the Nilotic or Omotic side or the original East Africans that we were in the Horn of Africa. However, because of that proximity and because of the great diversity of genetics in Africa, all, for example, the whitest of the white Northern Swedish person. And I don't know the most polite way to say this, the most Chinese Chinese person that you can think of are closer related genetically to, let's take Obang Metho as a great example, the great activist from Gambela, the Gambela region, a pure Nilo. Any Swedish person and any Chinese person is closer to Obang Metho or any of the people of Gambela or Beni Shangul or Gumus, the Anuak or the Nuar, is closer to them genetically, not phenotypically, this is why people say genotype and not phenotype. Genetically closer to them than to the West Africans and thus to Black Americans. 
So again, if the category that we're thinking critically about blackness is just having been in Africa, everyone's from there, then everyone's black. If the category is been in Africa and not part of that group of Eurasians that left 60,000 years ago, then the East Africans are black. If the category is proximity to Bantu West Africans who are the source of the DNA of black Americans, then the East Africans are closer to all white people and all Asians, closer to them than they are to all of the Bantu West Africans and thus all of the black Americans. And that is something very interesting. And that kind of puts us in this weird middle ground because phenotypically through our darkness and having been in Africa, we're phenotypically closer to the West Africans and black Americans, but we're, and, and even in a sort of, and this is where the art and the culture comes in and you're going to have to determine for yourself and your group has to determine. We're genotypically closer to Eurasians, but we're phenotypically closer to West Africans. So then you have to ask yourself, is it the outside that matters or the inside? Is it the phenotype or is it the genotype? And that's where science can't answer for you. That's where it's an art. That's where it comes to your individual determination, your self-determination and your group determination as a nation or as a small community or just you and your friends. I see a few more comments. Travel blob, yes. J Lions and Lassi, Ethiopia is diverse, very diverse, but not as diverse as the TPLF tried to make us. They try to say there are 87 ethnicities, 87 languages, 87 ethnicities. That's bullshit. There's three to four. And two of them make up over 90% of the population. And those two share 90% of the DNA with each other. So again, the Kushites, I'm just using it for short language, are 60% original East African, 40% prehistoric Eurasian. The Semites, again, using it for shorthand, are about 50% original East African, 40% prehistoric West Asian, and then 10% Bronze Age West Asian. Now, here's the interesting thing is that over time, half the Eurasians, if not all of them, or not most of them, well, I guess the ones in South Asia and Papua New Guinea and stuff are still kind of dark. Let's say the majority of Eurasians, by having gone to colder climates, and then later you can say colorism or whatever you want to say, kept getting lighter and lighter. Originally, it's for cold climates, and it, that's the selection process going on but they got lighter and lighter and lighter. So we got two different admixtures in the Horn of Africa of Eurasians, but the prehistoric ones that came 23,000 years ago were dark Eurasians, which is why the Kushites are still dark, but their facial features look a little different. The Semites have all that same DNA, but then spliced with Eurasians from 3,000 years ago instead of 23,000 years ago. And by 3,000 years ago, they got a lot lighter. And so that second batch brought a lot of the Asian sources of the Eurasian component in Ethiopians, a reassessment. It's on nature.com by a bunch of Italians. I can add that to the description later, but you can find that yourself. David Reich, very famous geneticist, and a bunch of other people, including Pickrell and Packendorf, ancient West Eurasian ancestry in Southern and Eastern Africa. You have the great American Bangladeshi, South Asian, Indian subcontinent, Razib Khan's unsupervised learning, razib.substack.com. I'll add his stuff too. I got data again from CIA.gov and I pondered all of these questions. Oh, I don't know if they're after me, but it looks like the chat disconnected and reconnected. I don't know if you guys are still here. It looks like there's plenty of you still there. Throw something in the chat if you're still there. I see like 13 people here. So are Ethiopians black? I answered it in different ways. Uh, I answered the genetic one, I think, very thoroughly. 
The cultural one, is there anything I can add? The only thing I'll add to the cultural component now, particularly this is for me and people like me, but now you have especially Ethiopians in America, but there are other English speaking diaspora as well, New Zealand, Australia, the UK, but I want to, Canada, especially I want to think of America as the main creator of culture and black Americans in America as one of the greatest exporters of culture that the world has ever known in this way, they represent that 20% of them. That's that Anglo-Saxon that did that with the British empire. And I want to think of Canada, New Zealand, Australia, the UK, South Africa as satellites. They have no real legitimacy. The whole Anglosphere, the way that they were satellites of the UK are, are satellites ever since the end of World War II of America. So now these Horners, these people of the Horn of Africa, these people of Ethiopia and Eritrea and Somalia and Djibouti find themselves in the United States. And they have this genetic material that I've described thus far, but now they're trying to adapt and assimilate to American society. So do they assimilate, as I've seen many elites do, to the WASP culture, the dominant white Anglo-Saxon Protestant culture, or do they try to assimilate, as I've, I've also seen, some elites, less, but also later immigrants who are usually not as elite? amongst the Ethiopians especially, adapt to the lower socioeconomic status neighborhoods that they're in that tend to have more Black Americans. So do they copy and mimic white American culture or Black American culture or some combination of it? Do they go with the people, the white Americans, who are genotypically closer to them but phenotypically more distant? Or do they adapt to the Black Americans who are phenotypically closer to them, but genotypically further from them? And, and the most important part is most people neglect the science in the first place. Most people are only on the art part of this equation. And different people have done different things. I, in my life, have never chosen to assimilate or adapt just to one. In fact, there was a funny episode, a friend of mine um, let's say I had two groups of friends in college, white Americans and black Americans. I had the black Americans on the basketball team and a white American friend who had the same majors as me, philosophy, political science, and dispute resolution. So with the academic English or standard English, or if you, I don't want to call it that, but if you want to call it white English, him and I were on the same page and we related on many levels. Then I had my black American friends with black English, basketball, video games, especially basketball video games and fight combat sports video games like UFC and uh, Fight Night, the boxing one as well, um, and maybe some illicit substances and uh, talking to girls and other things. We had a uh, relationship. I remember one time my white friend saw me code switching with the basketball team, and he would never say it publicly because he was ashamed, and he held his thoughts and could make your comments about that. But he saw us interacting because they were his neighbors and I would come visit their dorm and hang out with both of them at different times. And he confessed to me that he thought I was degrading myself and dumbing myself down to speak with them. And in that moment, I rebuked him. And the biggest thing that I understood is that he had so many holdups about the basketball team that he couldn't even understand that there's anything he could possibly learn from them, one. And even if he had nothing to learn from them, which is very hard for me to believe, he had so many holdups against them and so many stereotypes and just thought they were so dumb that he couldn't even be friends with them, which is a horrible way to live your life if that's 13% of your population. Um, don't be Scott Adams, the Dilbert guy. So I explained to him that the core of my identity was able to be a chameleon. People take that in a negative way, but I took it in a positive way because I followed the Apostle Paul, who says he's a Jew to Jews and a Gentile to Gentiles. So to my white American friends, I'm a white American. To my black American friends, I'm a black American. 
to my Ethiopians from Ethiopia, I'm an Ethiopian. To my Ethiopians from America, I'm an Ethiopian American. And I'm able to be all things to all people. And if you ask what is my natural state, my natural state is being with a person and being with people that allow me to use both academic English and black English, that allow me to speak in slang English as well as slang Amharic, proper old literary Amharic and Gz, and maybe throw in some Tigrinya, maybe a little biblical Hebrew, and maybe some Japanese words I picked up reading a manga or an anime. If you wanted to know the fullest version of me, it'd be somebody who can get through all that, be an Orthodox Christian, but be unafraid to throw a little Arabic, mashallah or inshallah or subhanallah or something like that in there. So I think I, I addressed the question. I want you to think about culture. I want you to think about science or population genetics in this regards. I want you to think about science and I want you to think about art, art and science, both of those things at all times. If you could think of examples where those things are not relevant, it's very hard. But in the question of whether Ethiopians are black, the too long didn't read is yes. The longer version is oh, this 46 minutes of my monologue and interaction with some of you commenting, but it gets complicated. And don't be so dogmatic about your presumptions because the science might unravel some of the things that you say. And especially if we want to look at, um, you know, I saw a horrible article recently about someone saying, don't worry about your kids being fat. To me, it's like totally neglecting science and medicine, especially Dr. Peter Tia's longevity book that just came out and a lot of the work of Nick Huberman as well. And, other people great in the uh, longevity space and anti-aging space. I saw um, and I've seen other people complaining that black women die at greater rates when they give birth than other women. I don't like categorizing this way, but there's a white woman economist I follow on Substack, Emily Oster. She went and addressed this issue and I would push the uh, genetics even further, she kind of just looked at this, the numbers and the statistics and was looking at like obesity rates amongst black women, vitamin D rates amongst black women, uh, which is related to melanin and how much time you spend in the sun. You can look at the socioeconomic status. I mean, there's so many different factors that you could look at before you jump to saying that it's racism causing more black women to die while they give birth. And another thing I would uh, push on is what does it mean to be black? If there are people from the Horn of Africa that are being put in these studies, and if we're talking about medicine, genotype is way more valuable than phenotype. If you're asking a question like, are you black, which has an element of art to it, maybe phenotype is more important. Maybe the culture that you want to identify with is more important. And so uh, we got a little bit of uh, Rachel Dolezal that I'll inject you with but also some science. It's not just willy-nilly, you are what you are, you know. If you want to be a unicorn, you could be a unicorn. I'm not that postmodern. I am postmodern, but I'm a postmodern reactionary. So I'm not going to tell you you're, you're, you are a unicorn if you tell me you're a unicorn. However, with the flexibility of genetics and culture put together, language, who your friends are, where you grew up, um, who you aspire to be like, who your heroes were, who your idols were. I think there's, there's room for flexibility and less dogmatism. Be dogmatic about things that matter, like the dogma of the Orthodox Church. Don't be dogmatic about things that don't matter, which are like things that we identify. So I think I've discussed this question pretty well. I'll look at a couple more comments. Blitzman777. Oh, that looks like a lucky number. On the topic of assimilation and the WASP paradigm, what are your thoughts on the ethno-narcissism argument that some have made, such as Touch Base Weekly? I don't know Touch Base Weekly, but I know um, this is a Second City Bureaucrat. I think it's mutual on Twitter that talks about the ethno-narcissism argument as well. I think uh, every group has the right to kind of be ethnocentric, right? Because what's the opposite? It's like hate your own ethnicity. Um, but obviously the kind of, uh, 800 pound gorilla in the room there is Hitler and Nazism and where ethnocentrism could lead. 
So I think there's a, a great balance between national and ethnic pride that doesn't lead to hubris and that doesn't lead to like maniacal world domination goals and especially not extermination, genocide, xenocide goals. When I was in middle school, I read Ender's Game series by Orson Scott Card. Spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it, Ender, the main character, is tricked through what he thinks is a video game, but uh, actually ends up being the full military might of the armed forces of Earth that is given control of to a middle school aged boy because he's so freaking brilliant. And through his great autistic military strategy that was unbeknownst to him was real and authentic, he wipes out an alien race. He commits the title of one of the books of the series, Xenocide. Title of another book in the series, Speaker for the Dead. He becomes the eulogist for these alien people that he committed xenocide against, wiped out. And it's funny because they think it's two different people, but, um, and they villainize Ender, but they valorize the speaker for the dead. Meanwhile, it's the same person. It, it's a text and a series by the great Orson Scott Card that helps one and helped me since middle school grapple with the kind of gravity of large scale warfare that we engage in. And it's in a science fiction realm, but it's applicable to our world. And you can think about not letting your hubris get to the point where you're exterminating whole classes of people, but also not having to apologize about who you're from. From the time I was a kid, my parents were so liberal and so feared, uh, I don't know, the boogeyman of, of uh, Nazism or something like that to such an extent that, and, and, and let's be real, they are the so-called Amhara elite that people bash all the time in the news, in the Ethiopian news sphere that uh, is the current regime and it's sycophants, but power hides itself. It doesn't like being out in the open. And so it took me a long time to realize my parents were part of the Amhara elite of Ethiopia, which is why they were able to come here to the United States in the early seventies, some 50 years ago, this year, actually 50 years ago. And because of that, they didn't grow up telling me I was Amhara. They're not like, oh, Henok, you're an Amhara. We are the proud Amhara people. We are the, the tribe of Amhara, the house of Amhara. We built Ethiopia. We did this. We did that. They didn't talk like that. My father never even told me his ethnicity ever. Even now, he would try to deny it if you tell him. He's always a man of Addis Ababa, the capital city. And from that, Mercato, which is uh, dead center and the most street smart, savvy area, the most cosmopolitan. His parents grew up in Derirawa and Harar, two other city states within Ethiopia, super cosmopolitan. My mother, has, her, her father was from Gondar, so she always mentioned that. But her mother is a, a Shoan who eventually made it to Addis Ababa as well from the Northern Shoah Plateau. My father's family from the Northern Shoah Plateau as well, but they were city people, urban people, civilized people. And um, my parents raised me not to identify with my ethnos or rather increased the scale of my ethnos to Ethiopian, increased it further to African, and increased it further to just human. And that's how they raised me. So they really fought against this hubris that could lead to extermination. So I would say Blitzman 777, um, assimilation is, I think, valuable. And any nation should want to assimilate the people inside of that nation. There are a lot of horror stories that have happened with forced assimilation. But I think assimilation is good. That's the classic idea of, do you want the melting pot, which is the old American idea of assimilation, or the new idea of American integration, which is the salad bowl. The salad bowl, everybody is different, but they're side by side, kind of like New York City, and to an extent LA, but LA is much more segregated. New York feels like you're all right next to each other.
um, and you get a taste of the world everywhere? Or do you blend them all together? Forget the salad bowl. Let's get the melting pot and make it one thing. And I, I think each nation should kind of decide for themselves. But I would say it's a balancing act between everyone should be proud of their ethnos, but they shouldn't have hubris over their ethnos and that the greatest vice of that hubris could lead to the extermination of others. Jovan John, this is super interesting. I went to a Serbian parish in Kansas City and there was a small enclave of Ethiopians who went. One of the older ladies looked exactly like my grandmother, 100% native, amazing. I'm so glad that you mentioned the Serbians, Jovan John. I had this great post on Twitter, maybe you can find it, comparing the Serbian patriarch, I'm forgetting his name, but if you Google or if you search on Twitter, his name along with patriarch Matthias or Matias, who's the Ethiopian patriarch, especially their side profiles, their beard, their liturgical vestments, and the fact that the, they're both patriarchs, the patriarch of Serbia and the patriarch of Ethiopia, they look alike. They look a lot alike. Uh, Abuna Matias, the Ethiopian patriarch, is, is a few shades darker, but he's an extremely light-skinned Ethiopian. And there is something extremely similar. And if I had to guess uh, on a genetic level what that is, they're probably both high in some type of uh, Bronze Age Anatolian farmer. I, I would put good money on that. They have other things too. Obviously, the Serb would have some steppe ancestry that the Ethiopian doesn't have, and the Ethiopian would have some Nilotic or East African ancestry that the Serb wouldn't have. But the Serbian patriarch, look up the Serbian patriarch, look up this, the Ethiopian patriarch, look at their, their frontal uh, profiles and their side profiles. Tell me they don't look alike at all, and I'll call you a liar. Tell me they look alike a lot, and I'll say, you know what you're talking about. By the way, in undergrad... In my uh, dormitory, I had a, a Serbian brother named Milos, and him and I were the only Orthodox in the dorm. And so we never had an Orthodox uh, club on campus, but him and I would always wish each other, um, you know, happy Pascha and, and all the great holidays. And whenever he'd see me from like 100 feet away, he'd look at me and he'd be like, Orthodox brother, hello, happy Pascha, happy Christmas, whatever it is. He's like, these Protestants with their holidays. And, we would have uh, funny moments together on campus. Him and I used to also play Risk. And I remember one of uh, the funniest, great Slavic moments I had with him is, uh, he was part Macedonian too, by the way, but he was uh, he grew up in Serbia. He flipped the Risk board over one time when I beat him so thoroughly. And he was like, because he had done this thing and he's like, this is most defensible move. And then I had beaten him with his most defensible move. And he just said like, this is bullshit. And he flipped the whole Risk table and it was one of those moments where like maybe a few years earlier or in another situation, I would have been like mad or if it was the context of somebody else, I would have been mad. But because it was my Orthodox brother, I wasn't mad. I was just like laughing because his flipping over the table showed how thoroughly I beat him. And it was his, uh, his mark of defeat. Uh, he, he went and uh, later snatched a, a young lady I was talking to and uh, – uh, they did some things while watching a Disney movie. So uh, that was his version of uh, revenge. That's how he got his lick back. But uh, to this day, we sometimes uh, write to each other on Facebook. And uh, we, we also had higher level uh, international relations classes together where him and I would always be the most informed people on issues abroad, on foreign policy, of critiquing the United States federal government's military abroad. And this was back in 2010 to 2012. Uh, Hannah Yami, does Amhara elite mean bloodline of royalty or just Amharas that have a lot of money? That's a great question. Um, I would say it has less to do with how much money you have because you could be dirt poor and broke. And I would say that there's actually like an epidemic of underemployed or it could be unemployed, but definitely underemployed Amhara elite men especially men, I think our women do better in the United States. But of men who are, I would say, demoralized by the diaspora and the system that they find themselves in. And I think this is one of the greatest explainers for why so many Ethiopian men choose to be taxi drivers. Or even I had a, a friend who was a computer science programmer with a very great salary, quit his job to own his own liquor store because they cannot stand middle management. 
they have to be their own boss. And whether it's owning a gas station, a liquor store, or driving a taxi, it gives them a level of autonomy that they don't have in the system of uh, the middle management bureaucracy, which James Burnham critiqued in his writings in the 20th century. And somehow the women are more comfortable with that than the men. But I would say it has less to do with your situation in the diaspora and more to do with your situation in Ethiopia, which also Hanna, corresponds to what decade did you travel here? If you go to someone like Professor Efrem Isak, whatever you think of his politics, he came here in the 50s. Now he's not an Amhara, he's half Yemeni, half Oromo, but he's some type of Ethiopian elite to have been here in the 50s. I would say the part of the meritocratic elite. And the beautiful thing about Ethiopia is there's always, it's not just blood, but it's blood and merit. There are people who have hereditary uh, privileges and there are people who gain those privileges through merit. I think when you look at those hereditary privileged people and you dig back deep enough, it was merit a long time ago and it happens to have a high percentage of merit uh, within those families in the first place. But it doesn't mean it's 100% hit. It's always hit or miss, you know, and, and that's uh, that's the way life is, c'est la vie, which is why the Balab Batwoch or the aristocrats so often would um, have children everywhere. You know, I'm publishing republishing the Amharic of my grandfather's memoir, as well as translating and publishing for the first time the English of his memoir. And in his memoir, my grandfather describes two ancestors that he has. Um, one ancestor, ha, I think that was Ras Gabri of Semen, has 18 children, uh, uh, obviously from different women. Um, one of his descendants is Dajjazmach, Haile Mariam Gabri, his son. Uh, excuse me, not Dajaz Machad. Uh, I think it was not Ras Gabri of Semen. It's uh, Dajaz Mach Haile Mariam, who's Ras Gabri of Semen's son, had 18 kids from a lot of different mothers. Uh, his descendant, Gabri Medin Haile Mariam, his son, uh, whom I am a descendant of, had 42 kids. And so there's a funny line my grandfather says where if you turn over a rock in Begemder or in Gwander, whether it's North Gwander or South Gwander, you'll find one of his relatives. My mom regularly jokes that we have a thousand relatives in the United States alone, 300 who are direct descendants of Ras Gabriel of Simeon and thus Emperor Susneos from the 1600s. And uh, she tells me an ungodly amount in Ohio, which is a state I've never been to. And she always warned me, don't flirt with any pretty women in Ohio who are Ethiopian. They might be your cousin. So I always avoided that. But to answer your question more fully, <clears throat> it's about your situation back home. And your situation back home, uh, you could be connected to the royal family, or you could just be in an aristocratic position because of your merit without any blood or hereditary connections. So it's about how close you were in proximity to power to the regime of Emperor Haile Selassie. And so um, my father had some distant cousins who are aristocrats, who are direct cousins of Emperor Haile Selassie, but my father has no hereditary aristocrats in his family. All of my dad's family um, from his side, like his pure direct side and their direct siblings they're all clergy. And in fact, uh, his grandfather knew the first patriarch of Ethiopia. My aunt used to have a letter and she lost it. I wish she had it. I would definitely republish it if we ever find it in our family. Um, but for example, from that same uh, grandfather of my father, my great grandfather, uh, paternally, I have, uh, well, his paternally for me, maternally for him, it's his mother's uh, father. Um, I have a 700 year old psalms of david that i used to pray and it's uh, made on goat skin parchment so uh, my father's family is a part of the clergy which i believe are if you look at the classes of ethiopian society part of the amhara elite in the sense that the clergy were hired for their intellectual work rather than their physical labor now some of them also had to do the physical grueling labor of farming um, but they weren't peasant subsistent farmers. Now we also have peasant subsistent farmers in our family, but it would be very rude to call them uh, the Amhara elite. And when they call all Amhara elite is very offensive. But I would say 
the clergy, the uh, merit-based aristocracy, and the hereditary aristocracy are all the Amhara elite. That's so my father's side, they're mostly clergy. My uh, mother, and, and, and uh, they're clergy, but they also ended up working for the government. So his grandfather, who was a priest, who ended up retiring from the priesthood, ended up working for the regime uh, of Emperor Haile Selassie. Um, his own father, who was a deacon, again, retires from being a deacon, ends up working for the regime in the Wallo area and in uh, visits Asab as well, which is now a part of Eritrea, the port city. Um, my mother's side is a mix that she does definitely has some uh, peasant subsistent farmers, but she also has a ton of uh, merit aristocrats and hereditary aristocrats or hereditary chieftains as well. So I would say merit chieftains, hereditary chieftains or aristocrats and the clergy make up the Amhara elite. And so I think I answered your question. Oh, Brandy's there. I am having a problem with Amhara elite comment whenever these so-called elites are making legitimate comments and on Ethiopian politics. Yeah, I don't know exactly what you're saying, Brandy, but yeah, I'm bothered when they try to paint everybody as Amhara elite, but I also think it's dishonest to pretend that there are no Amhara elite. And for most of my life, you know, for all I knew, I was, uh, because my parents came here with very little money um, and they kind of did the American dream, pulled themselves up by their own bootstraps, paid for their own college, paid for their own housing, worked crazy jobs. Um, you know, at one point my, my dad was like bicycling 20 miles while working and going to school. Like they did amazing things that they get the flex on me for, uh, that of course I can't verify, but I take their word for it. Um, but guess what? They were, they were not peasant subsistent farmers. And it took me a long time. Like, it's not that I thought they were, but I also didn't know that they were different from that. And so the realization in my 20s and 30s that they were not that, and not just that they were not that, but that they are related to emperors, kings, priests, deacons, uh, that they know the patriarch, that they know things like that. I would say it's not an accident. And it's a result of what happens to a lot of African countries, and for that matter, Asian and European countries, the brain drain, the elites of countries are drained. The first batch of immigrants are usually those with the closest connection to power, or if there's a regime change, those are being uh, directly persecuted and come as refugees. And the elites of all the different countries in the world get drained from their countries, which literally makes those countries worse. And then they get sent to America, which keeps making America better and better. Never forget, after World War II, it was former ex-Nazis that not only fled to Argentina, but that came to the United States and that created NASA and probably how we got an American on the moon, allegedly, if the moon landing wasn't faked. The way we got an American on the moon was through Nazi scientists and through Nazi science that was reappropriated and rebranded American. And so that those were elites of Germany converted to becoming elites of America. And part of my project and my hope long-term is that we can get some of these elites, or if not those elites, the children of those elites to begin moving back to their places of origin and building up those places. So we have to acknowledge their Amhara elite. Not everybody is Amhara elite, but we don't pretend that Amhara elite doesn't exist, even though some people use it as a boogeyman. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And the Amhara elite needs to get serious on their own time schedule. I'm not going to pressure them. I myself, I'm not going to get pressured by anybody. On their own time, they need to move back to Ethiopia and make Ethiopia great again. <laughs> Brian Super Macho, did I miss the verdict? Well, the verdict is is a pretty uh, nuanced, so it's uh, I'll give it to you again, but I don't want you to walk away with a soundbite. Ethiopians are black. The answer is, are Ethiopians black? The answer is, it depends. The answer is, don't use just population genetics and don't just use culture. Use a combination of population genetics and culture. Determine the answer for yourself determine the answer with your group and just know East African, original East African DNA is closer to all 
Eurasians, which means all Europeans and all Asians, than it is to West Africans. However, that's your genotype. The phenotype of the Ethiopian and the fact that they were in Africa and the fact that 50 to 60% of their DNA, depending on the person, is African, could have a cultural or art component that gives someone the discretion to say that they are Black. And so I could say you can define it either way. And the way people normally have these conversations is wrong. And so I tried to have it in as nuanced a fashion as possible. I wasn't expecting to speak for over an hour, but here we are. JNorm888, I think the uh, I think with Ethiopia, the brain drain has more to do with instability during a regime change. I agree. But, uh, you know, there was an old strategy. I have uh, my great uncles. I have a, a couple great uncles who came here. One in particular I'm thinking of. He's my grandfather's uh, first or second cousin. He came here. He went to Michigan State for four years in the 60s. He got his education and he returned to Ethiopia. And then he kept working and living in Ethiopia the rest of his life. Um, my father, uh, whose uncle that is, and my mother for that matter, were sent here with the express idea that they would be educated here in the United States and they would return to Ethiopia because the higher, inst higher education institutions were better in the United States than in Ethiopia. But also their parents who were Amhara elite knew that a communist revolution was about to take place. And no sooner did my parents come here than a year later, a communist revolution took place. Again, prompted, in my opinion, not by the Russians, but by the Americans, who allegedly were looking for a liberal revolution. Oops, they got a communist one instead. They got red terror instead. They got the greatest breakdown of the strongest nation state and empire in the Horn of Africa, which controls the trade routes of the Red Sea through the Suez Canal, and thus is a gate to Eurasia whether it's the Russian side or the Chinese side or the Indian side. There's a phrase that these spooks always use. They say that Ethiopia and the Horn of Africa writ large is of great strategic importance. So yes, you're, you're right about the instability there. And I have some ideas about who caused that and why. And even this week, uh, just today, I was reading a whitehouse.gov press release from Biden because of the Sudanese civil war that just popped up. He just sent American troops into Sudan, Djibouti, which is Djibouti is a pretty much weird satellite state shared between America and China and Ethiopia. That pisses me off a lot. And he says that the troops, the language is very tricky. You got to read it. But he says that the troops in Djibouti will stay there indefinitely. But with the relationship he has now with the current PM, I think he scared the shit out of him or maybe the PM was always in his hands. That's why I want Trump back so that he could get the, the America the hell out of the Horn of Africa. Because Trump doesn't give a shit. He threatened to bomb our dam one time via Egypt, but he doesn't really care about Ethiopia, which is the attitude I want from an American president. Biden, or at least the people who are controlling him, um, have serious, deep, maniacal world domination plans that involve Ethiopia. And now there are armed troops in the region there uh, that are there indefinitely. And again, they say indefinitely in Djibouti, but it sounds like also indefinitely in Ethiopia. The language is a little funny. And with the railroads from Djibouti to Ethiopia, it's trivial to go back and forth between those places, especially if you have the permission of the, the, the current prosperity gospel party regime in Ethiopia. Uh, Hollywood potato, stay in America. Our home countries betrayed us. Rise, embrace the dream. Yeah, I can do that. And then just assimilate away here. And then my ancestors can cry. Brian L. Super Macho. I always guess right when I think I'm seeing an Ethiopian slash Eritrean, et cetera, which suggests to me that there is a phenotype of East Africa that is quite distinct from other parts of Africa. Yes, I wonder if you would say that about if you saw the people of Gambela. A lot of times people see the people of Gambela and um, it becomes a sensitive issue sometimes, but they'll say they don't have the look. And the look basically means uh, they are not mulattoes. So, uh, but their DNA is the basis of uh, the African in the 
the look of the Ethiopian Eritrean. So I wonder if you'd be able to recognize them. I'm going to type a name in for you in the chat. It's a name that I mentioned earlier, Obang Metho. He's a great political activist that I appreciate. Mostly speaks in English, so you can find a lot of his stuff in English, but sometimes in Amharic as well. Obang Metho, and he's a, a great person of that. No, I know there's a lot of type of diversity there too. Yeah. But like I said, 90% of the population um, shares 90% of their DNA, which is uh, prehistoric West Asian and original East African. And the difference between the so-called Kushites and the so-called Semites of Ethiopia is about 10%, plus or minus. Depends on each person and depends on each area. And in the urban areas, people keep mixing and mixing. And the more er urban areas form, you're going to see just more and more of that in the horn. But that 10% extra is the lighter skinned rather than the dark skinned Eurasian. And they're the uh, Bronze Age West Asians from 3,000 years ago rather than the darker skinned prehistoric or Mesolithic Eurasians of 23,000 years ago. All right, thank you to all of the 14 people who are still here with me and all of the people who have liked it. I don't see any super chats. I don't see any super stickers, but thank you so much for your time. Are Ethiopians black? I hope my nuanced contextual and situational it depends answer did not frustrate you but pleased you greatly and that you continue to subscribe join like and share this with all of your friends this is the definitive answer and i will debate and battle anyone on this subject or discuss it with them they just want to discuss and think critically about art and about science peace be with you